Well, fall is definitely here and actually almost gone already. And as often happens near the end of a season, I tend to have a list of mini leaks or opinion pieces, if you will, that get grouped together in what I call musings videos. And the first subject of this musings video I want to talk about are ones having to do with NVIDIA graphics cards. The first of them, of course, being Lovelace that is starting to make the rounds more and more as a mid to late 2022 launch, which, by the way, I have to point out, a lot of leakers said it was more of a 2023 product, while well, I indicated that my sources were saying it was coming much sooner and that it would be coming next year, not 2023. And as more leaks come out, that seems to be the consensus moving forward. NVIDIA isn't just going to let RDNA 3 have half a year head start on them. And actually, most indications are that NVIDIA also doesn't want AMD to have a clear, convincing 20% win either, and that they may do anything including launching a card over 500 watts to beat them. And in fact, most indications are that this is indeed what NVIDIA's plan is right now, which my own sources haven't given me a firm number yet, and it's too early really to have one, I would actually argue, because even if you have one, decisions can be made that change the overall power consumption before it comes out. But anyways, the general feeling right now is that NVIDIA was always planning to launch Lovelace as kind of just a much bigger ampere on TSMC's 5 nanometer, and that it would be... I don't know, somewhere between 60 to 80% stronger than the 3090, you know, top Lovelace, the RTX 4090, if you will, while using more energy, but not as much as we're hearing lately, you know, maybe 400 watts. Having said that, in my older leaks, I was talking about how some people were saying that NVIDIA might actually push the card harder so that it can almost double performance and therefore get close enough to top RDNA 3 for it to be at least a little murky who's the strongest. Kind of like what's going on with the 6900 XT versus the 3090 right now, except maybe flipped, if you will, and AMD having a slightly even higher advantage than some would argue the 3090 has over the 6900 XT. Although, again, you're kind of getting in the weeds at that point. I, I don't think it's clear that either one is really stronger. It depends on what game you're playing, and that's what NVIDIA at least wants to obtain, and they might do anything to get there, including launching a card that uses an insane amount of energy. And that's actually the lovely subject I want to talk about today, because I keep seeing a lot of people talking about how this just isn't an issue. And I see some people on Twitter saying things like, oh, you know, it can use 500 or 700 watts. I don't care. You should care. If Lovelace launches with a card that looks like this, which to be clear, I didn't render this. This comes from another April Fool's post that I will link in the description if you want to see it. It's actually a pretty pretty well done and funny video. If, if they launch something absolutely insane, I don't think people should just be dismissing it like so many seem to be online. There are very real problems with having a 500 watt graphics card and not just in terms of your energy bill or the amount of heat it produces, but actually in terms of how this might in fact, hold back its ability to compete effectively with RDNA 3. And, well, there's much more to say about it, but first, an ad from a sponsor. Reesey here is not very good at hiding, and most web browsers are not very good at hiding or protecting your data. Today's video is brought to you by Atlas VPN. It's almost 2022. You should have a VPN to protect your data from hackers, governments, and advertisers, and enjoy streaming content that's usually arbitrarily locked from being watched in all regions of the world. But also, a VPN can actually be so much more than that. Atlas VPN is currently running a large discount for three years of service with three months of free service to get not just a VPN, but a VPN that also does these additional services. Block ads and malware for you, including malicious links and ad trackers. They actively try to get you the lowest price a company offers, subverting some company's attempts to charge you more based on your location or operating system. And it works on unlimited devices. It only costs $1.39 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Time is running out. Get your deal by clicking on the link in the description that really helps Moore's Law is Dead. Download Atlas VPN today. So yeah, this YouTube comment here that I showed before the sponsor break, I'm going to pull it up again and run with an analogy this person makes that I think kind of misses the point. And I don't pull this person up to dunk on them or whatever. I pull it up because this is a common comment I see, and I'm 
addressing it directly because I want to address it directly. This isn't an attack. This is, no, I really do want to address this directly. Let, let's go with the argument that the highest end graphics cards are your sports cards. It doesn't matter how much energy they use. Well, even with sports cars, it does, right? You know, Sports cars push the limits of a of wealth of engineering to get to the fastest speeds, even if you'll never really make full use of them because some people have the money and find it fun, right? But there are still limitations on where on like what they can do or what they have chosen to do so far. So here's a chart right here of the some of not all of them, but some of the fastest cars on the market right now that consume gasoline. Now, this is, of course, changing over time to more and more electric models. But for this comparison, I have to use gasoline powered cars. And and again, this isn't a direct comparison to what's going on with graphics cars. This isn't a direct metaphor, but I think it gets my point across. So look at the the miles per gallons here. You see, some people would say they aren't very efficient and that doesn't matter. Except if you look over the past 20 years, it seems like it has a kind of a limitation there, doesn't it? It seems like everyone's basically decided whether it's a Veyron or a Chiron, hope I'm saying that right, I don't actually follow these cars, that they're going to consume about 8 to 15 miles per gallon. So that hasn't changed, actually. No one's pushing out a car that's 3 miles per gallon, to my knowledge. Maybe someone will show me in the comments that that exists. And that's because, if you'll notice, it seems like all manufacturers, even when they're making a ludicrous hypercar, thinks you should be able to drive 100 miles, right? And we've always had graphics cards that sometimes push the envelope on power consumption, whether it's the GTX 480 or, you know, the Vega liquid that consumed up to 375 watts, or even the 295X2 that had a 500 watt TDP. Although actually this is total system power consumption in this chart here. It actually usually consumed less than 500 watts, you know? So, so there it is. There's this precedence of graphics cards sometimes almost getting to 400 watts but never really going above that. And if they do, it's very rare and below 500. That's kind of what we can compare the miles per gallons of these hypercars to. They never push out something that can only drive 20 to 30 miles because that would be impractical even to someone that wants an impractical car. And that's the point I'm trying to get across here at these graphics cards. It's not like you have a Bugatti that consumes, you know, or that only gets 10 miles per gallon. You have a Bugatti that can't even drive down a few blocks without needing to fill up. That is a major issue. And look, you know, the RTX 3090 Ti so far is still planning to come out in quarter one, as I've recently confirmed over a month ago. And more recent rumors are showing, yeah, it is. And again, I, don't, I didn't leak the 3090 Ti first because I thought it sounded ridiculous. I wasn't willing to confirm that until I literally had contacts specking out systems at OEMs for the 3090 Ti. So the people still doubting it, don't get me wrong, I still think Nvidia may cancel it, but right now, they haven't. It's a real card planning to come out in quarter one, but even that crazy card, one an OEM complained to me about and said, this is Lovelace, right? There's no way they're going to have, in the beginning of next year, an Ampere card that's only 5% better and uses this much energy. No, that that's what it is, a 3090 Ti. But even that 3090 Ti, is only about 450 watts. And to pull up that YouTube comment again, just because, again, I want to directly address it, he brags about having some car that uses 430 watts and cools just fine at 90 degrees Celsius. Dude, do you not see what you're missing? Your, yeah, your card is running at 90 degrees Celsius while consuming possibly over 100 watts less than top Lovelace. You know, we're not talking about a 8 nanometer card that's been overclocked to the max and is barely in a temperature limit or barely within temperature limits we're talking about something at stock on dense five nanometer transistors using significantly more energy than your overclocked card it is an issue it will be an issue and well i can't say that i've talked to any nvidia employees about this in the past week i did bring up this subject to some amd ones and all of them said the biggest problem they have is what is going to happen when you dump this much energy inside of a case, especially because most of it will probably be dumped in one location on the motherboard. What's going to happen to that motherboard? How are they going to cool this? Well, the fact of the matter is they can. You know, I'm not here to say this is impossible and NVIDIA is screwed. You know, there are wafer scale chips that are cooled. 
But those don't cost $1,000. Those don't cost $10,000. They cost an insane amount of money. And there's even 3D stacked prototypes going around where they have copper heat pipes and other cooling rods going through 3D stacked chips to cool them. Where there's a will, there's a way. But it isn't cheap. And that gets me to, finally, what is my overall point here? My, my, my point isn't to say that NVIDIA is just screwed and that they don't have options and that this can't work. It can, and they do have options. And I'm not confirming it will use this much energy yet. It's too early. But, you know, this is a hypothetical video. And hypothetically, if NVIDIA does push a card past 500 watts, and I mean, actually, it uses 500 or more watts regularly. It's not just like boosting to 550 watts and then throttling to 400, which I think might actually be the case and people aren't considering that. But if it's literally always using around 500 or more watts in typical gaming, this is a major problem. This is not a power bill problem. This is not a bad for the environment problem. This is a thermodynamics problem that they can solve, but that will probably not be any cheaper to produce than a 400 watt RDNA 3 card, right? We have cooled dual dies that are both using over 200 watts before just fine. It's more spread out. It's easier to do. It's less concentrated. It's less exotic to have that much heat in one die on a leading cutting edge node, it can be done, but I'm not so sure it will win at anything if it is done. I don't know if it will win in performance or power consumption or production costs. And that's something people need to stop dismissing. This isn't a situation of, oh, this is a sports car. Who cares how much uh, gas it consumes? Well, you, you do care how much gas a sports car consumes. They've all basically come to the same like limitation of you need to be able to drive 100 miles and those types of you know comparisons to a graphics card hold true and so people start taking this seriously and, you know even if it is a card for example that i brought up just a second ago that just boosts to 550 watts and throttles to 400 it doesn't really change how expensive the vrm and board costs are that just means that the cooling makes more sense and is more understandably done it, it would still be very hard on your power supply and a final thing to say about it, it would also be hard on your ability to play games, even if it's quiet. And I don't think NVIDIA would launch a loud card. Even if they find a way to cool it, which I'm sure they can, and they find a way to supply enough energy without breaking your power supply, and they probably can, just cost money. Well, even if they don't hurt the motherboard with concentrated heat, it's going to come out of the case somehow. And it doesn't matter how good your air conditioning is in your house if you live in a mansion. It's going to dump the heat in one location next to your arms or next to your legs if you're a typical person or even really anyone gaming on a desktop. And it doesn't matter how good your air conditioning is, it's all next to you and it will be hot. So stop just saying you have the air conditioning. You do, but to cool a whole house, there will be hot spots in your house where you're sitting if you get this graphics card, if it uses that much energy. And that's most of what I have to say about that, that people need to start thinking more intelligently about what it means if you use not more energy than any card has used before, but more energy than any of the recent cards that are already using more energy than any cards have used before. And not by a little, but by hundreds of watts more than overclocked existing cards that already push the limits. There's real considerations people will need to make if this card uses that much energy. And with rumors that Hopper may actually launch first as an MCM design using well over 500 watts, possibly up to 1,000 based on some people I've talked to, don't dismiss how insane a Hopper Titan might be as well. But I'm not confirming anything about Hopper. That's just, again, this is a food for thought video, okay? And, well, actually, there's one more musing I want to get to today, and it's actually from Intel. So, one thing I want to talk about is what's going on with PCIe 5.0 support with LGA 1700 motherboards. Now, the Z690 boards are already out, and they all have 5.0 support, except that they don't. You see, there's already some budget Z690 boards that... In fact, only a 4.0 support to save on cost. Now, these are bottom-of-the-barrel motherboards, but they're already out there. And so when you see these rumors coming out about possible H670 or whatever, or I think, what is it, H610 is the bottom one, uh, losing 5.0 support, this isn't really news if we already have Z690 cutting 
this support. And I actually reached out to a contact at Intel who basically told me that there's no reason any of these boards shouldn't be able to have 5.0 support all the way down to the bottom. There's no mandate that they can't. All of them can have 5.0 and some of them probably will. But that it's likely they will not exist below around $120. And so there will be some top H670 boards with 5.0 support that are meant to directly compete with X570. And there will be some more budget ones that are thought of as an almost X570, but cheaper than most X570. And that while there can be 610s, they probably won't have 5.0, although they probably will have 4.0 from the sounds of it. But you can't discount that there could be Frankly, LGA motherboards all the way down to like 40 bucks that only have 3.0 because this does cost more money. Although I guess the final thing to say is, if you've noticed from that quote, not as much more as you would think. Basically, the difference between a Z690 chipset and an H671 is like $5, but actually probably at most. And so I just want, I just thought at the end of this video, you know, again, it, it's not enough information to be its own video leak, but it is fun to throw that tidbit out there if you're wondering that that's the cost difference between these chipsets. Most of the cost really is the quality of the components, the amount of ports they put on the back of it, and yeah, how good their VRMs are. So that's why you see, I don't know, and the AMD motherboards, what is it? Uh, you see like B550 motherboards that are actually nicer than a lot of X570 motherboards because the chipsets really don't cost that different, even if they lack a little bit of I.O. as you go down. At a certain point, most of the features are actually coming from the quality of the components so that they can support them. And uh, yeah, that's actually going to just about do it for this video. I actually only got through half of the musing things I wanted to, and I'm sure I'll add more. So there's probably going to be a Another musings video before the end of the year, but I really hope you enjoyed this one. If you do not want to miss the next ones and the upcoming arc leaks I'm working on, and well, I mean, just all different types of leaks I'm working on, don't forget to check that you're subscribed to the Moore's Law is Dead YouTube channel and ring the bell button. And then, of course, if you have the extra money, please consider supporting us on Patreon, where you'll get early ad free access to Broken Silicon exclusive podcasts like Dashing that you guys vote on, and the ability to ask me and guest questions on Broken Silicon and Dyshrink. We have a really fun episode coming up that actually involves Daniel Nenny, only for patrons this week. So, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this, and I hope you will enjoy that. And, uh, yeah, thanks for watching. <laughs>